From the usual mix of early companies through to the present day, the Wirral has enjoyed a rich and varied railway history. The line from Birkenhead to Chester opened as early as 1840, and pursuing maritime interests, the branch down to Birkenhead docks by 1847, the basic network on the peninsula being completed by 1896. Owing to a variety of complex agreements, the peninsula was to become a northernmost outpost of the Great Western, as well as a westerly outpost for the LNER, who were also to operate the only passenger trains over a branch owned by the LMS. Even after nationalisation, lines and motive power depots on the Wirral change regions. Also, being somewhat off the beaten track, the area tended to be overlooked by the majority of railway enthusiasts. Even when passenger steam was on its last legs, most would dash off to record the expresses linking Shrewsbury to Chester, but overlook the less glamorous section from Chester to Woodside. By August 1968, steam would finally be superseded by more modern forms of traction. The Wirral was to prove one of the last steam strongholds. The final steam train went into oblivion over 30 years ago, on Monday the 6th of November 1967. In charge was one of the impressive Class 9 freight engines, 92203, which was making the last trip through the heart of the Wirral from Bidston Dock Birkenhead to the John Summers Steelworks at Shotton, thus ending nearly 130 years of steam traction on the Wirral. Described as situated twixt the Mersey and the Dee, the Wirral's very first railway had started near Bidston Dock, on the south side of the old Wallasey Pool, long before its conversion into the Birkenhead Dock system. The first two railways, both worked by horse and gravity, were built to carry sandstone. The Flaybrick Hill Tramway opened in 1818, closed some 40 years later. The second, the Stoughton Railway, opened in 1838, survived until the turn of the century. Remains include this former road crossing and this 300-yard-long embankment leading back into the heart of the quarries. Originally known as the Wagon Line, more recently it has been referred to as the Stoughton Tramway. At Port Sunlight, the Wagon Line made connection with the Wirral's first railway proper. Although a route from Chester to Birkenhead had been surveyed by George Stevenson in 1830, Local disputes and indecision delayed the opening of the original single-track Chester and Birkenhead Railway until September 1840. Once established, the peninsula's remaining lines were all built during the next 60 years. The last major link being the mid Wirral route through Upton and Heswell Hills opened in March 1896. The first steam to electric conversion occurred in 1903. Seeking to escape the sulphurous, smoke-filled river tunnel opened in 1886, thousands had deserted to the ferries, forcing the Mersey Railway to electrify its operations. For over 50 years, these American-style trains remained a familiar sight on the lines to New Brighton and Rock Ferry. Their story is told in another of our Merseyside Memories tapes. For full details, see the end of this video. Few new stations have opened this century. Wallasey Village in 1907, Caldy in 1909, Manor Road in 1941, but by far the most interesting, Port Sunlight in 1914. Although fully equipped with a booking office, the private halt was owned by the giant Lever Brothers Soap Factory and was initially restricted to employees only, being opened for two hours in the morning and evening. On arrival, employees could also transfer to an internal service, worked by close-coupled ex-North London Railway's four-wheelers with their distinctive birdcage roofs. Running down to the margarine works, these rattling, noisy trains were referred to as the soap and sometimes the carbolic, probably after the pervading smell 
of both the stock and the occupants. The service was discontinued in 1929, two years after Port Sunlight Station finally opened to the public in general in May 1927. One evening in 1919, a Great Western 060 Pania stopped to pick up homebound passengers off the soap. Unlike other stations on the line, Port Sunlight had no island platforms. The line had been doubled in 1847, and then to accommodate the tremendous growth in dock traffic, when Birkenhead was providing grain, flour and meat to substantial parts of the country, the first nine miles of the jointly administered Great Western and London and North Western line from Grange Lane to Ledgham Junction had been quadrupled during the first decade of the century. Note the express steaming into view in the background. Since opening of the halt, employees had no longer faced walking from other nearby stations such as Bebbington. Heading south to Hooton. Past the Port Sunlight pump house. And two of the main Lever Brothers soaperies. In the interchange sidings was a Great Western Armstrong goods engine, number 709 of 1872. As well as one of Lever's own fleet of locos. The company main line down to the margarine works can be seen swinging away to the left. For over 50 years these four tracks would thunder to the din of all types of passenger and goods traffic. Emerging from between the soaperies, one of a trio of brand new Andrew Barclay 060 side tanks delivered in 1919, hauling a string of empty edible oil tankers to the dispatch sidings. These powerful locos were not withdrawn until the end of the 1950s. Within the complex, the railway served the Port Sunlight Tidal Dock, which handled the bulk of the factory's non-rail imports and exports. When the system was extended to Bromborough Dock in the early 30s, it totaled 52 track miles, making it one of the largest private railways in the country. From 1905 to the early 50s, a two-foot gauge line ran within the soapworks. Work by diminutive outside cylinder 040 tank engines, usually hauling side tipping wagons, they were replaced in 1933 by horsepower. Amidst the general air of expansion, there had also been some very early closures. The Dodger, a short-lived local service linking Seacombe and New Brighton, was effectively killed off by the opening of Wallace's last new tram route in 1911. No stations were actually closed. However, in 1916 one did close its doors. Situated relatively close to New Brighton and serving the nearby golf course and sand dunes, Warren Holt had failed to generate a regular clientele. With creation of the Big Four in 1923, the constituent companies on the peninsula included the Mersey Railway, which remained independent, the Great Western and London and North Western, the Wirral and the Great Central. In the past, the CLC also had goods facilities. The Great Central was absorbed by the LNER and the Wirral by the LMS, which jointly with the Great Western also took over the main Birkenhead Chester line together with its various branches. Many of the distinctive and in some cases decidedly clapped out older company locomotives rapidly disappeared, including the Wirral's notable 444 tank engines. One improvement was the introduction of a New Brighton Euston service in October 1923. The through carriages, which ran via West Kirby and Hooton, took just over five hours and survived until 1939. 
Throughout the 30s, the joint station at Woodside remained busy, with over 160 train movements, including empty stock workings. Intermixed with the Great Western locals, often hauled by 262 Prairie tanks, were the company expresses to Paddington, and daily trains or through coaches to many resorts on the south coast. There were also the LMS services to Liverpool, Euston, Bristol, Cardiff, Aberystwyth and Barmouth. Anxious to capture something of the transatlantic liner traffic from Liverpool, the Great Western advertised its Woodside Paddington expresses, but at five and a half hours they compared unfavourably with the crack four-hour LMS timings between Liverpool and Euston. Undaunted, the Great Western always advertised all expresses arriving at Woodside as terminating at Liverpool Landing Stage, where they had a booking office, passengers crossing the Mersey by ferry boat. The major event of the decade was the electrification of the LMS lines to West Kirby and New Brighton, which resulted in through under-river services to Liverpool Central. Latterly, three types of loco ran the steam services, the oldest being the 062 Webb coal tanks with their tall chimneys. By 1938, the bogey carriage stock, all of the compartment type, dated variously from 1893 to 1932 and was of Lancashire and Yorkshire, London and North Western, and LMS origin. At peak times, six coach trains were provided. Here, one of the Fowler 262 tanks steams towards New Brighton. This class had been the mainstay of the former Whittle Railway services since their arrival in 1930. Approaching in the opposite direction was a Mersey Railway set on driver training duty. Although regular steam operations ceased on Saturday the 12th of March 1938, various dignitaries, including the president of the LMS, Sir Josiah Stamp, congregated at Birkenhead Park two days later for a ceremonial last steam train. Consisting of five brand new first-class mainline corridor coaches, the special was entrusted to a gleaming Stanier 262 tank number 200. With the advent of the new electrics, memories of changing from steam to electric at Pneumonia Junction, the nickname given to Park Station, swiftly evaporated. The shed at North now closed and its allocation was dispersed. In BR days, the LMS standard 3F shunters, although officially allocated to Mollington Street, were often found at Bidston Shed. For dock work, the joint sheds at Mollington Street housed a motley collection of short wheelbase tank engines. For example, 7862 was an 042 saddle tank of 1901. 3575 was another 042 from the Great Western. While 7100 was one of the specially designed LMS 060 Fowler dock tanks dating from 1928. After the war, one of the class simmers amidst the cranes at Duke Street. On Tar Road, an open cabbed 2021 class Great Western Pannier, warning bell ringing, shunts a wagon. On the north side of the float, an ex-Great Central 060 saddle tank of 1897 stands in the former Kelvin Road goods station at Seacombe. Bell tolling at Morpeth Dock, 2129 was allocated to Mollington Street from 1939 to 1953, the last of these versatile machines bowing out in 1959. Still with LMS numbers, a former North London 060 was caught on Shore Road. Several years later, another of the class, 58854, hauled wagons along Shore Road. Gradually, these older types were displaced, some duties being taken over by 040 saddle tanks. By 1956, diesel shunters had assumed responsibility for most of the ever-dwindling dock-based duties. However, a few steamers were still operating in the early 60s. 47164 was one of the last Fowler 2Fs specially designed for short radius curves. 
By far the most impressive machines seen on the docks were those going for export. Over the years, hundreds made long sea voyages to the many countries of the empire, especially India, Africa and the Far East. This monster seen arriving at Victoria Wharf from the Bayer Peacock factory was one of the giant garrets en route to Rhodesian railways. With its 482 plus 284 wheel arrangement, when finally assembled, it would weigh 225 tonnes and would be used on hard slogging freight trains hauling up to 1,400 tonnes. When delivered during 1953-4, these were the last steam locomotives to be built for Rhodesia. A wide range of carriages also passed through the port for transshipment to all corners of the globe. This one to be hoisted on board Clan Cumming, which dated from 1946. Apart from traffic handled by the Big Four, all the dock work was in the hands of contractors. The variety of these privately owned engines was bewildering. One of the most notable was the inside cylinder 060 saddle tank Avon. Built by Manning Wardle in 1887, it had a domeless boiler and an archaic high-arched firebox. Operated by the contractors Joseph Perrin, Aaron went for scrap in 1950. Owing to the sharp curves, most private locos were short wheelbase 040 saddle tanks. Predating the Reverend Audrey's Gordon was this Peckett, dating from 1895. Vulcan of 1900 hailed from Andrew Barclay. Probably the most resplendent of all was the bright red outside cylinder Home Pride. Operated by Messrs Paul Brothers Flower Millers and built by Hawthorne Leslie in 1924, she was to find further employment after leaving the mills, being operated by W.J. Lee of Seacombe until 1964. This dingy veteran was unusual in having a number as opposed to a name. Another Hawthorne Leslie, B-17C, dating from 1900 and formerly owned by the Butterley Company, survived in the fleet of Rays Limited until 1960. She then joined the rusting ranks awaiting the torch. The last of the privately owned locos in regular use was Remus. Owned by Cudworth and Johnson, she had been built by Hudswell Clark in 1920 and was formerly owned by John Summers of Shotton. Here she steams along Duke Street as late as 1965, shortly before her withdrawal. The former overhead railway 040 well tank Polly, built by Kitson in 1893, worked the tug coaling wharf at Monks Ferry until August 1961, when this delightful loco, nicknamed Lively Polly, was scrapped. Today the docks no longer echo to the whistles of the busy little locos, which once abounded throughout the network, traversing roads and crossing bridges en route to the miles of sidings and quaysides. For the first five years after the war, the railways continued to enjoy a reasonably high level of patronage. In 1949, a Midland compound drew into Platform 1 at Woodside. Even prior to the transfer of the area to the London Midland region of British Railways in 1948, the use of Great Western motive power on passenger workings was already in decline. An LMS 264 tank waited to depart for Chester, but change was in the air. The motor car was in the ascendancy, and as a result, many of the Wirral's more isolated rural or little-used stations were set to close. Birkenhead Town had gone as early as 1945, although the derelict platforms and buildings were still standing 21 years later. Situated close to Birkenhead Central on the nearby Mersey Railway, it had been virtually redundant for years. Today, this is all that remains of the old station facade. On the Bidston-Wrexham line, the remote Storton for Barnston closed in 1951, followed by Burton Point in 1955. Also by the early 50s, a heavy question mark hung over the financial viability of the 12.5-mile Hooton-West Kirby branch. In 1954,
Caldy, Thurston and Kirby Park were all closed to passengers, although the last two did remain open for goods. The branch was essentially tank engine territory, some fitted for push-pull. Shortly after it had closed to passengers, Bill Tunley, the porter signalman, passed the single track staff to the crew of 5174 as it trundled its rake of elderly Great Western stock through Thurston, possibly with the empty stock from the daily school train. However, the goods yard situated on the landward side of the D estuary was still busy and even handling some very unusual cargo. This was a trainload of uranium ore from the Liverpool docks, which was to be stored on site. The pannier may well have been shunted into the yard to allow a passenger train to pass. The ore was carried up from the sidings by lorries owned by LF Briggs. It was then heaped up into man-made mountains. Similar stacks had also been built further down the line at Park Gate. The ore was actually destined for the Capenhurst nuclear power plant and when finally taken away, every last piece was picked up by hand so that not a trace remained. Thurston typified the problems of many rural stations. It was too far from a centre of population. The approach road was long and exposed, takings were minimal and despite the goods yard, it was overstaffed for the amount of traffic generated. Even the daily afternoon goods latterly only ran as required. In the summer, there had been some passengers, but for the rest of the year, very little. The branch, which was condemned as a non-paying, semi-suburban line, which could not be economically revived with diesel traction, closed to passengers on the 17th of September, 1956. On the last day, 40102 arrived and ran round its train at West Kirby. Passing 40121 at Heswell, then one of the four intermediate stations still open. Steaming away from Hooton on a through train to Woodside. On July the 11th, 1957, the branch was host to a royal visitor. With the four royal lamps on the front, 42375 and 42594 later haul their dark claret coaches through Morton. Despite some regular goods traffic and the protests of local residents, the Hooton West Kirby line closed entirely on the 7th of May 1962. Two years later, track lifting trains moved in. Eventually, the old station buildings were demolished. This was the former joint station at West Kirby, which dated from 1886. Later in the 70s, much of the derelict track bed was transformed into the Wirral Way. This was the site of Thurston Station. For the railway historian, Hadlow Road is the star attraction. Dating from 1866, the station house and booking hall, which survived the general demolition, have been beautifully restored and a single track relayed adjacent to one of the platforms. The aim has been to capture the atmosphere of a typical country station. Today, it is hard to imagine a train an hour during the war, a staff of six, and after 1959, eight and nine Fs on freights like the early morning Hooten Docker. The crossing gates and this signal box were transplanted from Hassel Green Station. This view shows Hadlow Road 40 years ago, just before the line closed to passengers. The rundown on the old joint line began with the end of passenger facilities at Ledsham in 1959 and Mollington in 1960, although both remained open for goods for several more years. 
Next on the hit list was the Three Mile Seacombe branch, which had opened in 1895. Originally served by both the Wirral and the Great Central, it had, since 1938, been a westerly outpost of the old London North Eastern. For many years, most passenger trains on the seacombe Wrexham route had been the preserve of the former Great Central class C-13 and C-14 tanks. Designed by J.G. Robinson for suburban passenger work, these 442s dated from the early 1900s. Filmed in 1952, these tanks remained on the line until at least the end of 1958. Veteran N5 0626928 was from a design first introduced in 1891. A J11 pounded through on a heavy goods. In 1949, a C14 442 pulled into the island platform at Liscard and Poulton, the only intermediary station on the Seacombe branch. Eight years later, one of the underpowered Stania 262 tanks introduced in 1935 was en route to Wrexham. Passing the station sidings in the other direction was a standard post-war 262 tank. These had started displacing the older Great Central types in 1952. During the dying days of the branch, these 82,000 class tanks were responsible for most passenger turns. When the line closed and the rails were lifted, the cutting degenerated into a rubbish tip until transformed and widened into the approach to the second Mersey Road tunnel opened in 1972. To give it its full title, Seacombe and Egremont, was always regarded purely as temporary, as long forgotten plans had existed to erect a grander structure closer to the Wallasey Ferry Terminal. In latter years, the ramshackle ensemble of corrugated sheds and wooden buildings exuded an air of decrepitude. Destined, some hours later, to be the last passenger train on the Seacombe branch, 41201 arrived at Bidston on the 3rd of January, 1960. At the end, the timetable showed about a dozen weekday arrivals and departures. This closure was unusual in that although the Seacombe branch was closing, DMUs were displacing steam on the bulk of the service, which would now terminate at New Brighton. With the tracks leading to the iron ore terminal on the right, a Wrexham Rattler approached the signals guarding the S-Bend, sweeping across Bidston Moss. Having received all clear, the driver opened the regulator. Steam still dominated most freight in the Bidston area. This Jinty, for example, would have served the yards on the New Brighton line. It would also have shunted the surviving facilities on the Seacombe branch, which were closed months later in December 1960, although the tracks as far as Liscard and Poulton remained for storage until June 1963. As dock traffic dwindled, Bidston, shed code 6F, had closed in February 1963. Its allocation, including 9Fs for the shot and ore trains, being transferred to Mollington Street. However, passenger steam on the mid Wirral line was not quite a spent force. A couple of times a year, usually on bank holiday Mondays, certain trains were re-timed, hauled by steam, and operated between either Chester Northgate or Wrexham and New Brighton. The mid Wirral line was still popular, and the four-car DMUs could not have handled the expected crowds. Departing from Bidston, inbound trains still took the curves on the west side of the Bidston Triangle. But instead of turning east at Seacombe Junction, they headed across the sand dunes towards New Brighton. Using a rake of somewhat musty spare coaches, 
Panya 4683 of Christ Neuid arrived at the resort on the 7th of June 1965. These bank holiday trains, which were direct descendants of the old popular Seacombe Kaigoorlie Castle excursions, were used both by people escaping into North Wales as well as by those from Wales heading for the coast. 4683 of collet design dated from the mid 1930s and these were probably the last ex-Great Western locos to operate scheduled passenger trains on the Wirral. The 060 propels the coaches forward in order to reverse them into the station yard. A through trip from New Brighton to Wrexham, stopping at all 18 intermediary stations, took approximately 90 minutes. Arriving at Upton. Four six eight three tackled the steep ascent up Storton Bank. A somewhat rusty four six zero pulled into Neston North in nineteen sixty six. Having tackled the strenuous climb up from Bidston, the four six zero stopped for water before continuing on to Wrexham. Despite their undoubted charm and the sparsity of operation, these unusual steam turns only attracted the more determined enthusiasts. Crossing the denavigation on the Harden Bridge. These delightful excursions, almost relics of a bygone age, last operated in 1966. On the old joint main line, the four tracks were still busy in the mid-sixties, despite the increasing use of heavy lorries. A stint by the line side would usually produce steam galore. Southbound passenger trains would all have started from Woodside and most of the freights from within the docks. Joining them would be a steady stream of traffic from the interchange sidings at Port Sunlight. One of Mollington Street's stud of crabs, a type long associated with Birkenhead, draws steadily away towards Hooton. The old joint goods office was visible in the background. With two four-wheel cattle trucks at the front, this 8F haul train had almost certainly originated from Morpeth Dock. A 264 tank, having received the all-clear, departed bunker first for Hooton. This sister loco was in charge of a mixed rake of coaches in London Midland and Western Region liveries. Another 280 departed from the interchange sidings. Commodities leaving the giant works included sulphur residue, animal feeds, lubricating oil, chemical solvents and dyes. Soap and soap powder went to reception sidings all over the country, the last major firm to take regular rail deliveries being Woolworths. Vans of margarine continued to leave by rail until 1965. The next train was in charge of an austerity 280 WD introduced in 1943. Black 5 coasted through on its way to the docks and quaysides.
Looking particularly clean and smart, one of the last LMS-built 0604Fs, number 44593, arrived from Mollington Street to reverse into the interchange sidings. In the meantime, 45058, a 1934-built Stania, gallops past on yet another southbound freight, probably heading for the Birmingham area. In hot pursuit was a 260 on a passenger train. The main Lever Brothers Railway Control Centre stood in front of the company's pump house. The 4F, probably on a train for the Manchester area, will travel via Ellesmere Port and Frodsham. Traffic coming into Levers included Fuller's Earth, Stone, Chemicals and Sulphur, Milk, and during the 50s the largest commodity was Coal, or Slack Traffic as it was known. The mass ranks of LMS and Standard types was briefly broken by the arrival of one of the named B1s, 61021, from the northeastern region. The range of locos represented the diversity of destinations, although by this time very few ex-Great Western types penetrated the old joint line. In the past, the Great Western had allotted suitable names to some of its vacuum-fitted express freights, running to and from their goods station at Morpeth Dock. For example, those outbound included the Meat, the Feeder, the General, the Mersey, the Birmingham Market and the Cambrian Pioneer. And those inbound, the Northern Docker, the Flying Skipper, the Farmer's Boy, the Shipper and the Northern Flash. These evocative names lingered on well into the 1960s. Although the joint line was still relatively busy, by the mid-60s the beaching axe was in full swing. Passenger lines were closing everywhere, together with scores of unprofitable goods yards, many of which had survived as outlets for an ever-dwindling demand for domestic and industrial coal. Amongst the yards to go were those at New Brighton and Wallasey Grove Road, both as from the 30th of October 1965. Having already served New Brighton, this 060 with its battered ensemble of 16-ton minis, as these steel mineral wagons were known, was on the Monday to Friday goods, which then stopped to shunt the yard at Grove Road. The distinctive sights and sounds of traditional yard activity seemed deceptively all too permanent. For many years, this yard, being relatively close to the seaside, had been used during the winter to store a motley collection of bathing huts. The DMU was on the New Brighton Wrexham service introduced in January 1960. Eventually, the Monday to Saturday departures were diverted to Birkenhead North. The Bidston West Kirby line also lost all its coal traffic in October 1965. These views of 47627 on the Monday to Friday pickup freight were taken at Hoylake in May 1964. Situated on a spur off the main line, the sprawling Mollington Street complex had evolved since the 1840s. Both the Western and the Norwest, as they were known locally, once had their own separate staff, sheds, and locos. Rivalry could be intense, but tempered by the recognition that both companies tended to offload too many obsolete elderly engines to this outpost of operations. Even in the mid-sixties, nothing much had changed. It still tended to be a repository for run-down locos transferred from other sheds already closed. Overlooked by the gasworks and situated close to the nearby carriage and wagon sidings, Birkenhead South Shed, latterly shed code 8H, as well as acting as a stabling point for visiting engines, had its own allocation of nearly 100. Included 
were nearly all the remaining 10 cross-deboilered 9Fs. Built at Crewe in 1955, these differed from other 9Fs in having double-barreled boilers and no smoke deflectors. But starting in 1958, their crusty preheaters had been sealed and they had been adapted for orthodox working. 92029 would remain operational until early November 1967. Also on shed was one of the Riddle Standard 5s fitted with Caprotti valve gear. These locos tended to require experienced drivers. Dumped on the scrap lines were scores of lifeless engines, some barely 10 years old, as ever more steam turns were taken over by diesels. With maintenance at a minimum, some inmates were latterly in appalling external condition begrimed, rust-stained and leaking steam and water from every orifice. Steeped in a congealed mix of oil, dirty water and choking coal dust, the smoky environs offered all the sights, sounds and smells of a working steam depot. In wet or foggy weather, the overall effect tended to be even more depressingly atmospheric. On the 22nd of October 1966, the Liverpool University Public Transport Society organised a marathon tour entitled the Wirral and Mersey Special. The Wirral portion really began at Ellesmere Port. Just before the special train reporting code number 1T50 arrived, a grimy 9F and a standard Class 5 shuffled through en route to Mollington Street. Here the Britannia Pacific 70004 posed for photographs. The organisers had requested a jubilee. Instead they got William Shakespeare, but in pristine condition. On arrival at Green Lane Junction just north of Rock Ferry, the Britannia was taken off. She was replaced by one of the Hughes-designed XLMS crabs. Although advertised as being repainted in LMS livery, stick-on letters were meant to have been used, she had been beautifully scrubbed and cleaned the previous day, and it was said if you really looked, it was just possible to detect the letters LMS on the gleaming tender side. On departure, the 260 then forked left towards the docks by way of the 1847 link which passed beneath several road crossings and through a series of short tunnels until emerging close to Canning Street North Box. This marked the demarcation between the state-owned tracks and those of the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board. The box controlled a gated level crossing. Originally plans had existed for a road bridge, but finally, recognising its importance, the crossing had been jointly funded by the Great Western, the London and North Western, Birkenhead Corporation and the dock board. From Canning Street, the special began the slow crawl along the dock board main line. This was used by BR traffic entering the docks or travelling to and from the Bidston area. A man with a red flag had been designated to walk in front of the seven-coach train to ensure its safe passage over the numerous road crossings along the exposed section of Beaufort Road. approaching Wallasey Bridge Road. Beyond the level crossing gates, the train passed the newly opened domestic coal concentration depot at Birkenhead North. Once clear of Bidston D Junction, 42942 was opened up for the steep ascent to Heswell Hills.
At Neston North, one T-50 stopped for water and further photographs. On leaving the Wirral, the tour which had started at Liverpool Riverside finally ended up at Liverpool Central. It had been very ambitious, organised by university students with four engines, seven carriages and all for a fare of two pounds. 42942 would be condemned on the 21st of January 1967. Tours were to be the order of the day when it was announced that the long-established Woodside Paddington Expresses were to be discontinued as from the 6th of March 1967. Steam hauled between Woodside and Shrewsbury, Mollington Street men handled the 15 miles to Chester where Shrewsbury men and machines took over. Woodside warranted the use of a pilot, usually involved in empty stock workings to and from the carriage sidings. Controlled by a signal cabin on the end of Platform 1, 45145 was preparing to depart on the Zulu, the 11.45 to Paddington, shortly before the end of steam. Built in 1935, this loco would be condemned by the end of the year. On leaving the station throat, there was a testing 565-yard tunnel with severe curves, greasy rails, poor ventilation and a grade of 1 in 93. This required considerable skill on behalf of the crew to tackle such a grade from a virtual standing start. Latterly, the nine daily expresses, less on Sunday, were allowed 30 minutes for the 15-mile run to Chester, as opposed to 50 minutes for stopping trains. passing Mollington Street Shed. All the Paddingtons called at Rock Ferry. Just over two miles out, this was the interchange point with the Under River Electrics. In 1936, over 90 trains in and out of Woodside had made connections here. The only other stop for the bulk of these star turns would be at Hooton. A Stania tank 42613 accelerated away towards the south on a short mineral train. Sister engine, North British built 42587 of 1936, shunted in front of the large mill at Hooton on a bitterly cold grey November day in 1966. Situated some five miles south of Rock Ferry, Hooton retained the atmosphere of a country Victorian junction. Virtually all steam hauled Chester Woodside expresses stopped here for connections onto the Helsby branch. Standard Mogul 76047 hurried away towards Woodside, past the tall London and Northwestern Hooton North Junction box. From the old West Kirby branch platform, William Shakespeare was caught on a surprise visit to the Wirral. The Britannias were not regular performers in this neck of the woods. Looking decidedly shabby and shorn of her nameplate, the 462 still retained a sense of power. In 1951, she had been proudly displayed at the Festival of Britain. Now the Pacific was heading north with a train of empty iron ore tipplers bound for Bidston Dock. Numerous light engines scurried through on the four tracks.
Long trains of oil tankers coming from the refineries at Stanlow and heading south reversed at Hooton. 92127 has arrived bunker first off the Helsby branch. Having been uncoupled, the 9F then ran round its train before departing chimney first towards Chester. Another of Mollington Street's trusty 264 tanks, having stopped at Hooton on a Paddington, makes a particularly spirited start, filling the cold air with a pall of black smoke as it hurried past Hooton South Junction box and the Helsby branch forking away to the left. The passenger economies unleashed by the beaching report led to the demise of the Woodside Paddington service with its nine daily trains and one overnight sleeper. The passing of these historic century-old expresses was marked in great style by the Ian Allen Birkenhead Flyers run on Saturday the 4th of March with Castles, Clun and Pendennis at the helm as far as Chester. One distinguished railway observer wrote, public interest in this occasion was on an almost incredible scale. The two castles had indeed been seen by hundreds of people lining the route. Because Platform 1 at Woodside could handle no more than seven carriages, participants had to transfer to shorter formations for the Chester Birkenhead portion. Both these trains were in the hands of Riddle Standard Fives. Probably few of the hundreds of visitors were aware that the front of Woodside Station had been built the wrong way round. The magnificent entrance and booking hall on the south side were never fully used. To provide direct access to the adjacent tramway and ferry terminus, a hole was simply knocked in the north wall and a temporary wooden booking office erected. This remained throughout the life of the station. Many local Baconians grumbled that Woodside was ruined by having a magnificent Queen Anne back but a shabby Mary Anne front. On the actual last day of passenger steam, Sunday the 5th of March, Clun was again in action, but on this occasion the castle did not remain at Chester, but carrying members of the Stevenson Locomotive Society sped into the Wirral. Here Clun edged onto the down slow at the start of the four-track section at Ledsham Junction. Passing through Hoot. Overlooked by the former London and Northwestern signal box at Bromborough. Entering onto the tracks leading towards the remains of Birkenhead Town Station and the one in 93 grade down into Woodside. A tunnel gong device within the tunnel allowed footplate men to pinpoint their progress through the all enveloping murk. The approach to the station had the only distant signal in the country that was pulled on the approach to a terminal or dead end. This told the driver that platform one was clear to the buffer stops. The cabin at the end of the platform had displaced an older box nearer the tunnel mouth during the 30s. A brass plate glinting in the sun the castle backed up the incline to be cold and watered. This was almost certainly the last occasion on which a great western loco visited the old joint shed at Mollington Street. In the past, named westerns had been a feature on passenger and freight turns, adding a little colour and dignity to the drab industrial surroundings. To meet demand, the SLS had to provide a second train, this one behind 44680.
flanked by the camel-laid cranes, the special drifted past Mollington Street. Dating from June 1950, this was one of the BR Black Fives. Arriving at Platform 1 with 92203 in attendance. From here, the visitors were taken on a round trip to and from Chester, behind the specially cleaned double-chimneyed 9F. speeding through Mollington on the more rural double track section south of Hooton. Amidst all the excitement, a chilling moment of reality as two coal 9Fs were hauled south, probably to the scrap lines at Speak Junction. Returning from Chester, 92203 whistled through deserted Ledgham station on the down slow. This station had closed to passengers in 1959. Double chimney 92234, also bound for Woodside, sped through Bromborough on the down slow. Having been turned, 44680 prepared to take on coal and water for the return leg of the trip. With red number plate and highlighted smoke box, station pilot 42616 hauled the carriages forming one of the specials out of the sidings prior to reversing down the steep grade into Woodside. This was eventually to be the last Stanier 264 tank to be withdrawn in the autumn of 1967. Shortly after, 92234 rolled in from Chester. This was one of the last of the Riddle 9Fs to be built. Having uncoupled, the pilot then migrated to Platform 5. The high, double-arched, cast-iron and glazed roof at Woodside was highly regarded by the Victorian Society, which deemed it well worthy of preservation. Both tour locos were now ready to depart. First to leave on the up fast was the Black Five. Six months later, she would be condemned. In between came 42587 on the up slow, with the 1455 Sundays only Woodside Paddington stopping at Rock Ferry and Hooton. Finally, 7029 effectively brought to an end 127 years of steam passenger operation between Birkenhead and Chester. However, steam could still be found in many corners of the Wirral during the next eight months. Some locos even penetrating Woodside, but not on passenger trains. On the dockboard main line linking Birkenhead North to Canning Street, the steamers were highly visible, often running light, sometimes hauling various freights. On Beaufort Road, the rails were laid in the verge between the north side of the highway and the southern perimeter of the Dockboard Estate. Until 1935, trams on the Corporation line of Docks Route D had worked in parallel with the steamers. 
Now it was Corporation Blue and Cream buses. The old railway companies and latterly British railways had to pay the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board for all transits along the Dock Board main line running from Wallasey Bridge Road to Canning Street North. Because of the number of unguarded crossings, speed was kept to a minimum. This 9F was in charge of a particularly heavy looking train of probably bogey steel carriers. After taking water, 92152, without today's precautions of flashing lights and barriers, but simply guarded by a man with a raised arm stopping the traffic, edged cautiously over the busy Duke Street intersection. A small percentage of ore landed at Birkenhead did not go to Shotton. 92106, crossing the entrance to Victoria Wharf, was heading a train of laden tipplers en route from Ray's Wharf to Furnaces in the East Midlands. The last major operational yard on the Dock Estate was the former Great Western Goods Station at Morpeth. Dating from the late 1850s, it finally closed in 1973. Light engines would proceed cautiously from Canning Street North Box, receive instructions from the yard staff, complete several manoeuvres and then couple up to its already martial train. The diesel shunter on the left would in all probability have brought cattle trucks round from the Lairages adjacent to Woodside Ferry. A boatage service had once ferried Great Western barges across the river from Morpeth. 92014 headed for the Edgerton Bascule lifting bridge. This part of the journey was quite hazardous. Drivers had restricted vision. The tracks ran on the dockboard highway and it required constant vigilance to avoid any unfortunate confrontation between road and rail vehicles. These were the oldest docks and had been rail served for some 120 years. Viewed from across Edgerton, an 8F rumbled over the 1932 lifting bridge, which today has been carefully preserved. It was the loss of the lucrative fresh, chilled and frozen meat trade. Already gone were meat and livestock Green Cross Expresses, coupled with increasing containerization, which slowly killed off the once regular parade of freight trains. With a couple of cattle trucks at the front, this Black Five may well have been hauling the latter-day version of the Great Western's former name freight, the General. When this sequence was filmed one evening during the autumn of 1967, such steam-hauled mixed freights were already something of a rarity. These scenes, filmed a year earlier, showed plenty of activity. With the relatively new blue funnel complex on the right, 42613 passed under the now derelict footbridge at Canning Street before transferring from the dockboard metals onto the BR connection up to Green Lane Junction. The tracks crossing from left to right fed in and out of Morpeth Dock. 92106 was following the same path with its load of iron ore tipplers. This Black Five was in charge of a more tasty cargo, chocolate biscuits, en route from the Cadbury's factory at Morton. 92165, one of Birkenhead's longest serving 9Fs, headed into the dark canyon leading up to Green Lane Junction. By 1969, traffic from the docks had dwindled to such an extent 
that the old joint line was to shrink back to just two tracks. At the beginning of November 1967, the mechanised coaling towers at Mollington Street were still functioning, helping serve the 40 or so remaining engines, which included about 24 operable 9Fs. This panorama was taken from the top of one of the towers. Although their days were numbered, the 210s were still turned out on a variety of freights, as well as the Bidston iron ore trains. Having gained a certain local notoriety, the ore trains were destined to bow out in some style. Even the local press took more than a passing interest. George Crugine, to whom this tape is dedicated, was then editor of the Liverpool Echo. A lifelong railway enthusiast, he organised a footplate ride on one of the 9Fs. Crossing over the track bed of the former Hooton West Kirby branch. Now in firm control, George guided the empties through Upton towards Journey's End at Bidston. Shipments of ore had started operating from Bidston Dock in the early 50s, when John Summers became an integrated steelworks, complete with blast furnaces. They stopped taking delivery of pig iron from the potteries, relying instead upon imported iron ore. 92045 was one of the first of the heavy mineral 210s assigned to Bidston in May 1956, when two million tonnes of ore per year were being handled. Prior to this, LNER 04s, Black 5s, 8Fs and WDs had worked this traffic. From 1961, the ore trains became almost the exclusive preserve of the big 9Fs, and by the mid-60s, Mollington Street had an allocation of approximately 50. Severe restrictions were placed on load capacity. An ordinary nine could take 11 fully loaded 65 ton hopper wagons. A former Crosty boiled nine, 10, and an 8F only eight, all including a brake van. Control from Seacombe Junction Box, the first part of the journey was an operational nightmare as the heavy, slow-moving, loose couple freights had to cross not one but two frequent electric suburban lines. Also on the mid Widdle section, they had to fit in with the DMUs working on the Wrexham New Brighton service. At peak times, when a boat had just arrived, departures had initially operated seven days a week round the clock until eventually objections from residents led to a dusk till dawn curfew. One boatload of ore meant 20 train loads. Sometimes three boats would arrive in a single week, providing the Mollington Street men with welcome overtime on the spaceships, as the 9Fs were nicknamed. By the end of 1967, the only surviving coal yard in the Bidston area was at Upton, the first station out on the Midwirral line. There was one daily trip, Monday to Friday, latterly the preserve of a Black 5 or 8F. Formerly it had been a 3F or a 264 tank. Having shunted the small yard, which finally closed in April 1969, the loco then returned to the former Great Central sidings at Bidston the remnants of which were set to disappear in the mid-1970s. The same engine would then propel a load of vans to the Cabris factory at Morton, returning shortly after Chimney First. This scene was taken at Liso Station and shows the Black Five having just left the Cabris siding en route for the docks and the old joint main line. A fully laden ore train was allowed 48 minutes for the 12 and a half mile trip. As they were not equipped with continuous braking and were only loose coupled, the maximum permitted speed was 35 miles an hour, the locos working chimney leading on the ascent from Bidston D Junction. 
For the most part, the grades were between 1 in 100 and 1 in 120, and it was for this reason that severe restrictions were placed upon load capacity. For example, this loco, with its tractive effort of 40,000 pounds, would be pulling 11 loaded hoppers with a combined weight of just under 1,000 tonnes. Ever since its opening, the Mid Wirral had always had a high percentage of mineral traffic, originally coal from the Welsh mines going to the docks. At the busiest times, the trains would be shuttling up and down approximately every two hours. But if there were no boats, there would be no trains. The drivers and firemen found the big 210Os capable and reliable. They rarely encountered any major problems. For the men, the iron ore trains were called the pickle after one of the processing procedures undertaken at Summers. With the wind in the right direction, the rasping bark from the exhaust could clearly be heard as far away as New Brighton or Morton. The section of all was one in 75. On the return to Bidston, when the locos always worked tender first, a maximum of 33 empty hoppers was permitted, equal to three train loads. This meant some spaceships, like 92111, would occasionally follow with just three brake vans. The first train of the day always returned light engine. Sometimes the second and third would do the same. For the men, the object was to earn bonuses by getting back to Bidston as fast as possible. There was no hanging about. At Leighton, a load of empties clatters back down to the dock. A final view taken at the summit of the long ascent up from Bidston. The last of the pickles would run on Monday the 6th of November, just two days after Woodside Station suffered the ultimate indignity. Served latterly by two and three car DMUs, the closure of the station, which had once supported a staff of 75, represented a major architectural loss. Designed by R. E. Johnson and dating from 1878, its distinctive roof plus the high Gothic detailing reminiscent of St Pancras were worthy features. For the station masters, among them the father of the war poet Wilfred Owen, the tunnel bottleneck had been the bugbear in chief, especially the trickiness of getting empty stock to and from the carriage sidings. Those headaches were now finally at an end. With most people electing to change at Rock Ferry to cross to Liverpool, Woodside had gradually outlived its usefulness. Despite its architectural significance, the 90-year-old building was knocked down, ending up as a car park, and latterly a resting and turning point for the various buses still running down to Woodside Ferry. Now, the steam too was going. At 11.15am on Monday the 6th of November, the final summer's ore train left Bidston to blast its way through the Whittle countryside. At the regulator was Sir John Summers. Beautifully cleaned and polished, 92203, destined for eventual preservation, was in charge of this memorable last trip. 
Nearing the end of its historic journey, the gleaming loco drifted through Burton Point. Even the wagons look cleaner than usual. On arrival at Shottick Sidings, where a stiff breeze was blowing, the 210, still displaying its special headboard, was uncoupled, leaving the wagons to be moved on by one of Summer's fleet of diesel locos. Normally locos had returned bunker first, but on this occasion 92203 was to be turned for her final departure from the Wirral. Smoke blowing defiantly, she brought to an end some 12 years of 9F haulage on the pickle. Vestiges of the old order were quickly removed. The flaccid water columns and the mechanised coaling towers. Erected as late as 1955 as part of a modernisation programme, they were reduced to rubble with a little assistance from a controlled explosion. Diesels remained on site until, with insufficient traffic to justify its retention, the shed finally closed in November 1985, 18 years after the last steamer chuffed away. The final obsequies being performed by a Class 47 diesel. Today, the outbuildings, offices, shed and tracks have long gone, leaving just a silent, desolate wasteland as a stark reminder of the peninsula's last main locomotive depot. But this was not quite the end of the steam story. In July 1972, the small industrial 040 saddle tank efficient was used on the Birkenhead Docker Tour No. 3, organised by the Wirral Railway Circle. Acquired by the Liverpool Locomotive Preservation Group in 1970, she had been restored in the former loco shed used by shunting contractor W.J. Lee until 1971. It was situated at the junction of the Dock Road and Birkenhead Road in Seacombe. Unfortunately, the group's ambition to establish a museum on Merseyside was eventually thwarted by roadworks which isolated the shed by severing these connecting rails. Efficient had been built by Andrew Barclay for McKechnie Chemicals of Widnes in 1918. Those taking part in the 1972 tour were squeezed into a motley collection of brake vans and mineral wagons. Here the 040 diesel shunter Dorothy Lightfoot piloted Efficient over Duke Street Bridge, causing confusion galore for the passing motorists as both were on the wrong side of the road. Lucy was also owned by the Liverpool Locomotive Preservation Group. She had been the last of three engines, all named after one of the daughters of her owner, the chairman of the Hutchinson Estates and Dock Company of Widnes. Built by Avonside Engineering of Bristol in 1909, she had worked on until 1970. Housed for a while at Seacombe, she had, together with Efficient, subsequently been moved to Steamport at Southport. Then, in 1978, the 060 made a memorable visit to the Birkenhead docks. Hauling a packed train of brake vans and wagons, she toured every accessible nook and cranny. Here she is dwarfed by one of the classic post-war Isle of Man steamers and a raised tug. Passing along the side of Victoria Wharf, which had been lengthened and relayed with new track as late as 1960. In a moment, note the imposing hydraulic tower with its distinctive clock face. Dating from 1863, this building actually had a railway track running through its front door. 
alongside the 8,500 ton City of London dating from 1947. These vessels operated passenger and cargo services to India and Pakistan. On the dock board, main line, behind the wall separating Corporation Road from the dock estate. To date, this was the last time steam ventured onto the docks. For many, it must have revived memories of barely organised chaos of the past, of the import of grain and meat, of coal to replenish the hungry bunkers of the many steamships, of the long gone weird and wonderful small engines, of squealing flanges on sharp curves, of warning bells on the great western panniers, of the smell of cattle, of shrieking whistles, of men with red flags, of open cab locos, especially in winter, of freight trains with names and engines with nameplates, of the policemen on point duty at Duke Street 24 hours a day, of impatient little engines competing with road traffic and waiting in long queues for a bridge to open, of tracks disappearing into transit sheds, of grain, coal and scrap metal, of delays and frustration for road users held up by seemingly interminable bouts of shunting, some people actually used to allow at least 90 minutes to cross from Wallasey to catch a bus or train at Woodside. And finally of a tangled confusion of another age when non-stop railway activity really had been the lifeblood of the docks. The end of the summer's iron ore traffic came in February 1980. This also signalled the end of Ray's shunting locos and their depot within the Bidston Dock complex. For three days in 1988, as part of the firm's centenary celebrations, steam returned briefly to Port Sunlight. Two locos representing the old joint companies were used operating down the firm's old main line to and from the margarine works. Both were built in 1924, the 060 tank for the LMS and the 262 Prairie tank at the other end for the Great Western. Intriguingly, both have been rescued from Woodham's scrapyard at Barry Dock, and both now operate on preserved railways. Sadly, all internal rail operation at Port Sunlight has since ceased, and the rails have been lifted. On the docks, rail traffic has all but ceased, having given way to lorries. But the old signal box at Canning Street still stands guard, waiting, perhaps for the day, when trains will one day return. And just to prove miracles do happen, over a weekend in October in 1997, 92203, the very loco which had performed the funeral rites 30 years ago, travelled by road from the West Somerset Railway to Shottick sidings, specially to commemorate the passing of the steam-hauled iron ore trains. On the Saturday, the loco had been in steam and working on the internal steelworks system, but the event was not open to the public. On the Sunday, however, the public were allowed access. Unfortunately, due to a derailment the previous day when the leading coupled wheels rode up on the nose of a joint, Black Prince was restricted to a very short run. But steam had returned to Shotton in a very imaginative way. 92203 has since departed for the Flangoflin Railway. 
her all too short weekend visit conjured up half forgotten, almost ghost like memories of the majestic 210 O's echoing across the Wirral countryside.